let me start by asking you all a question. Which is the largest organ of the human body? Yes, I'm sure most of you would have guessed it right. It is the skin. So skin is the largest organ of the human body. And yes, probably the toughest organ too. It acts as a barrier and protects us from the harmful effects of sunlight or maybe extremes of temperature, the pollution or the microorganisms what we come across day in and day out. Skin also regenerates every 27 to 30 days. But in spite of all these properties and being a very tough organ, it can be affected by a lot of disease processes. And it can be something as simple as a pimple or something like allergic disorders or pigmentation disorders of the skin or infections of the skin or something more serious like the skin tumors. So in today's session, we will discuss skin tumors. So before going to the skin tumors, let us brief upon the histology of the skin. The skin is lined by the epidermis and the dermis. Epi means above. Now epidermis is lined by stratified squamous epithelium. Now why is it called stratified squamous epithelium? That is because there are multiple layers of squamous cells or keratinocytes which are stacked upon each other. That is why stratified squamous epithelium. So the main cell in the epidermis is a squamous cell. That is a polygonal cell with a centrally placed nucleus. Now apart from the keratinocytes, we have the melanocytes. Now the melanocytes are the cells which produce the brown pigment that is the melanin which is responsible for the color of the skin and it also protects us from the harmful effects of the UV light. The other cells are the epidermal dendritic cells. Now these cells act as antigen presenting cells. Now what do you mean by antigen presenting cell? So whenever we come across some microorganisms or allergen, allergic factors, these cells take them up and send them to the lymphatics. So they act as defense mechanism. Other than that, we can have the tactile cells for the touch sensation, that is the Merkel cells, and lot of sensory nerve endings. Now let us see a little more in detail about the epidermis. Now there are five layers of the epidermis. The stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and stratum basal. Now I'm sure most of us get very confused about how to remember these layers of the skin. But uh, there's a very simple mnemonic to remember these layers. Come, let's get sun burnt. So that is for stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and stratum basal. Now, below the epidermis, we have the dermis. The superficial portion of the dermis is composed of loose connective tissue and that is known as the papillary dermis and the deeper portion of the dermis is composed of dense connective tissue and that is known as the reticular dermis. Now apart from all these structures, the connective tissue, the dermis has a lot of uh, nerve endings, the sebaceous glands, the sweat glands, apocrine glands, all these are present in the dermis. Now with this backup, let us go to squamous cell carcinoma. It is the second most common tumor which arises in the sun exposed sites. Now, what are the different locations of squamous cell carcinoma? So remember, it can occur wherever we have a lining of squamous epithelium, that is the stratified squamous epithelium. So it can arise anywhere in the skin or even in the mucous membrane like the oral cavity or the cervix, the esophagus, wherever we have the squamous epithelium. So what are the common sites? The common sites are face, pinna, back of hands, lips, anal canal, and glans penis. And it is more common in men than women. Now coming to the etiology and pathogenesis of squamous cell carcinomas. So what are the risk factors for these squamous cell carcinomas? The most important risk factor for squamous cell carcinoma is exposure to UV light which causes DNA damage. Now, exposure to UV light causes uh, squamous cell carcinoma doesn't mean that when we go in the sunlight for a few minutes or few hours, we are at risk of developing squamous cell carcinoma. It's not like that. This means it is directly proportionate to the duration or the hours spent in sunlight. So it is more common in people who are exposed to sunlight for a longer duration like uh, farmers, field workers or even miners. 
The second point is chronic immunosuppression. So in patients who are on chemotherapy or radiation therapy or maybe post organ transplantation, the susceptibility of the squamous cells increases to infection by certain oncogenic viruses that is the HPV virus. HPV is human papilloma virus. So to be specific, the serotype will be 5 and 8. So the cells are very weak and the immunity of the body is very less. So at this time, HPV attacks the cells and it develops them into malignant cells. The next point is industrial carcinogen, that is exposure to oils or chemicals can irritate the squamous epithelium and lead to increase in risk of uh, development of squamous cell carcinomas. Chronic non-healing ulcers, that is chronic osteomyelitis, due to the chronic irritation, has a risk of developing squamous cell carcinoma. So now next is margolin's ulcer. Now this point is very important, this terminology. What is margolin's ulcer? It is squamous cell carcinoma occurring in old burns scar. Ingestion of arsenicals can irritate the mucosa and give rise to squamous cell carcinoma. Other risk factors can be ionizing radiation, now coming to oral cavity squamous cell carcinomas, the chewing of tobacco and betel nut chewing increases the risk for development of the oral cavity carcinomas. Next is the pre malignant conditions which increases the risk for development of squamous cell carcinoma if not treated for a duration of time. So these conditions can be solar keratosis or Bubbles disease. Now coming to the genetics of squamous cell carcinoma. So the most important genetic factor in development of squamous cell carcinoma is mutation in tumor suppressor gene TP53. Now this TP53 is considered as the guardian of the genome or the policeman of the genome. Now what it does is it arrests the damaged cells in the G1 phase of cell cycle. So the cell cycle has four phases G1, S, G2 and M phase. And the cells which have not entered the cell cycle are in the G0 phase of cell cycle. So whenever a cell is undergoing DNA damage due to exposure to UV light or any other risk factors what we saw previously, TP53 will arrest those cells in the G1 phase and it will not allow them to progress in the cell cycle. So cells will not proliferate. And later what can happen is these cells will either be repaired by the DNA repair genes or if the or if the damage is beyond repair, it will undergo apoptosis. So that is the role of P53. So what happens when the TP53 is mutated? So in mutated P53, this function is lost and the cells continue to proliferate and the mutation will be passed on to the daughter cells. So that is the role of P53 in the causation of squamous cell carcinomas. Now the other genetic factors are mutation in DNA repair genes. Now normally when there is a small uh, defect in the DNA, there is a certain set of genes in the body which are known as DNA repair genes, they will repair those defects. But in squamous cell carcinomas, there is a mutation in these genes. And one common disorder which occurs due to mutation in DNA repair genes is xeroderma pigmentosum. And these patients are susceptible or have higher risk of squamous cell carcinomas. Now the other genes which are involved in the pathogenesis are the RAS, activating mutation of RAS and loss of function mutation of notch receptors. Now what is the function of RAS and notch receptors? So normally, RAS and notch receptors help in normal differentiation and proliferation of the cells. Now let's go on to the morphology of squamous cell carcinomas. So grossly, these can be very, very small lesions or nodular lesions or they can ulcerate. And in advanced stages, they can be very large lesions, ulcer proliferative or fungating or what we commonly call as cauliflower-like growths. So as we see here, these are some nodular lesions with central ulceration and in this case it is a large lesion it's like a cauliflower like growth so these can be the morphologies of squamous cell carcinoma coming to the microscopy so the squamous cell carcinoma can be divided into squamous cell carcinoma in situ or invasive squamous cell carcinoma so what do you mean by squamous cell carcinoma in situ so when 
the malignant cells are limited to the epidermis, only in the epidermis, that is squamous cell carcinoma in C2. Now, what is meant by malignant cells? So, let us see the features of malignant cells. So, the important features of malignant cells are, first is increase in the NC ratio. Now, what is NC ratio? NC ratio is nucleocytoplasmic ratio. So, normally, it is 1 is to 4 to 1 is to 6. But in malignancies, the nucleus can become very large and it can attain an NC ratio of almost 1 is to 1. So, that is one feature of malignancy. The other feature is pleomorphism. Pleomorphism means different shapes and sizes of the cells. So, if we see the malignant cell, some will be large, some will be very small. There will be difference in the shapes and size of the cells and the nucleus also will be very irregular. So, that feature is known as pleomorphism. The other feature is hyperchromasia. So, there will be increase in this chroma chromasia. Chromasia means color. The nucleus, which is generally basophilic, becomes more deeply basophilic in color. So, that is increase in hyperchromasia, hyperchromatic nuclei, what we will call it as. The next feature is presence of abnormal mitosis. Now, mitosis is a feature when the cells are proliferating. So, normally in any cell, whenever there is proliferation, the mitosis will be something like this, like a caterpillar. Now, this is known as a bipolar mitosis. Now, this can even normally be seen because normally also we know in our body, the cells keep proliferating. But in malignancy, apart from these type of mitosis, we have some abnormal mitosis. So, abnormal mitosis will be multipolar, like as we, as we see here, it will be multipolar, unlike this bipolar mitosis. So, presence of abnormal mitosis is a feature of malignancy. So, all these features will be seen in the squamous cell carcinomas. So, when all these cells are present only in the epidermis, it is called a squamous cell carcinoma in C2. When they start invading into the dermis, they breach the basement membrane and go down into the dermis. That is known as invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Now, this is the microscopic picture. So, the squamous cells will grow in nest. It can be of different shape. We can have different nests of cells or it can be in singly dispersed. Then one important feature of the squamous cells is presence of keratin. So, the normal feature of squamous epithelium is production of keratin. So, in squamous cell carcinoma, we will have lot of keratin pearl formation as we see here. The center of the tumor nests will show keratin pearls and we have this pleomorphic squamous cells. Pleomorphic means different shapes and sizes. We have this pleomorphic squamous cells which is going down into the dermis. Again, one more picture which shows the pleomorphism. It's very evident in this picture. We can see how different the shape, the nucleus are. So, this pleomorphic squamous cells and a beautiful keratin pearl which is seen in the center of the tumor nest. Now, coming to the types, what are the different types? So, we can uh, divide squamous cell carcinomas as well differentiated, moderately differentiated and poorly differentiated. Now, what do you mean by the term differentiation? Now, the term differentiation means how closely a particular, a given cell appears compared to the normal epithelial cell. Now, here we are talking about squamous cell carcinoma. So, we know the squamous cell carcinoma is polygonal in shape. Now, when we take a tumor cell, how closely this tumor cell resembles the normal squamous cell, that property is known as differentiation. When the resemblance is very good or very high, it will be called as well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So, in well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, we have polygonal cells, large amount of keratin and squamous, lot of squamous pearl formation. Coming to moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, here we have anaplastic squamous cells. Now, what do you mean by anaplastic squamous cells? Anaplasia means lack of or loss of differentiation. The cells lose the property of resembling as a normal squamous cells. So, only one few cells in between will show some keratin. Overall, keratin pearl formation will be lesser, pleomorphism will be more, mitosis will be more, hyperchromasia will be more. And in poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, 
So all these features, very highly pleomorphic, very anaplastic, high mitotic activity, very hyperchromatic, very dark nuclei, and there is li literally no keratin pearl formation. So that is well moderate and poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So coming to metastasis, now squamous cell carcinomas can metastasize or spread to the regional lymph nodes. Now for example, if the squamous cell carcinoma is there on the leg, it can spread to the inguinal lymph node. Treatment, usually complete excision is the treatment for squamous cell carcinomas. Now coming to the prognosis, the prognosis depends on the TNM staging. Now what is TNM? T stands for tumor. So that is either generally in TNM staging, it will be either the size of the tumor or the depth of infiltration. Next is node, the lymph node meta. So whether metastasis to lymph node is present or not. And the next point is metastasis. That is distant metastasis, either to the liver, bone, lungs or anywhere. So the prognosis will depend on the TNM staging. Now let us just summarize squamous cell carcinomas. So it is the second most common tumor arising on the sun exposed areas. Men are more frequently affected than women. The risk factors, the most important risk factor is UV light, exposure to UV light, immunosuppression, remember the HPV virus serotypes 5 and 8, industrial carcinogens, chronic non-healing ulcers, old burn scar, the margolins ulcer, ingestion of arsenicals, pre-malignant lesions, Bowen's disease, solar keratosis, tobacco and beta nerd chewing for oral cavity squamous cell carcinomas. Now, after risk factors, the genetics. So the important genetics is mutation in P53, DNA repair genes. Grossly, it can be nodular, ulcerated or large ulcerative proliferative lesions like cauliflower-like growth. Microscopically, polygonal cells, large amount of keratin with lot of keratin pearl formation if it is a well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma or depending on all these features it can be moderate or poorly differentiated metastasis to regional lymph nodes and prognosis depends on the tnm staging so that was about squamous cell carcinomas so now let's talk about basal cell carcinomas so basal cell carcinomas Cytologically, these are similar to the basal layer of the epidermis and that is why they are known as basal cell carcinomas. So if we see the basal layer of the epidermis, the nucleus are more hyperchromatic, elongated and denser as compared to the superficial layer. So the basal cell carcinoma resembles this layer and that is why it gets its name. It is a locally invasive tumor, slow growing tumor and it burrows to the underlying structures just like a rodent. So that is why it is known as a rodent ulcer. It is common in the middle age and the most common location of basal cell carcinoma is the face. So if we draw a line from the angle of mouth to the pinna, above this line, this location is the most common location for basal cell carcinomas. Now coming to the etiopathogenesis, what are the risk factors? So light-skinned individuals with less melanin, melanin production have higher propensity or higher chances of development of basal cell carcinoma, prolonged exposure to sunlight, immunosuppressions, any conditions which can cause immunosuppression may be chemotherapy, organ transplantation, radiation therapy increases the risk for basal cell carcinoma and defects in DNA repair genes is a very important risk factor for basal cell carcinoma. So coming to the genetics of basal cell carcinoma, the most important is mutation in tumor suppressor gene PTCH and P53. So what is PTCH? It is patched homologue. So what does PTCH do? So normally PTCH regulates the hedgehog signaling pathway. Now what is this hedgehog signaling pathway? So this is a group of proteins which give signals to the embryonic cells. Now, hedgehog signaling pathway will give signals to the embryonic cells for their differentiation and proliferation. proliferation. Differentiation means it can be become either like a smooth muscle or it can differentiate into squamous epithelium or a cardiac muscle. So, this pathway gives signals to the embryonic cells.
for differentiation and even proliferation of these cells. Now what PTCH does is, it negatively regulates this pathway and stops the hedgehog signaling pathway. So stops proliferation. But when there is mutation in the PTCH gene, this pathway becomes more active. This activates the genes involved in cell proliferation and survival. Hence, it develops into malignancy. So it can occur in sporadic form or germline mutation form. Now, what is this sporadic and germline mutation? So for any malignancy to occur, mutations should occur in both the alleles of a gene. It should be in this, both the alleles. So in sporadic form, this mutation occurs later in life, after birth. Both the mutations in both the alleles will occur later in life. But in germline mutations, one allele is already defective at birth and the second is normal. And mutation in this one occurs sometime later in life. So that is the difference between a sporadic form of BCC and a germline mutation. So sporadic form of BCC, the PTCH mutation occurs in about 30% of cases due to UV damage. In germline mutation, the syndrome, it's a syndrome which occurs, the nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome, also known as the Gorman syndrome. It is autosomal dominant and it is characterized by multiple basal cell carcinomas. Now, germline mutation already occurs in one of the PTCH alleles at birth itself. And the second allele is inactivated later on by exposure to sunlight. Now, the other genes which are involved in BCC are mutation in the P53 gene. So, P53 gene is a tumor suppressor gene and it is considered a policeman or guardian of the genome. And what it does is it arrests the defective or the damaged cells in the G1 phase of the cell cycle. So, when there is mutation, there is no arrest of the cells and the cells continue to proliferate. Now, this is common in both sporadic and familial basal cell carcinomas. Next is defect in the DNA repair genes. So one common disease which occurs, condition which occurs due to defect in the DNA repair gene is xeroderma pigmentosum. So these patients have increased incidence of basal cell carcinoma. Now coming to the clinical presentation. Now how do these present? So as discussed before, the most common location is on the face just above the line drawn between the angle of the mouth to the pinna and it appears as small pearly papules, little whitish like pearly papules and underneath we can see some epidermal, dilated epidermal vessels. So that is a classical picture of a basal cell carcinoma, the classical picture and the classical location. Now coming to the morphology, the morphologically it can be nodular like small nodules or later on it can ulcerate ulcerative lesions, superficial or sometimes just erythematous. Erythematous means reddish in appearance or nodulo-ulcerative. Now that is the most common type of basal cell carcinoma, a nodule which is ulcerated, nodulo-ulcerative type. Now it is called as rodent ulcer. It erodes the underlying structures just like a rodent. So the common terminology for basal cell carcinoma is a rodent ulcer. And nodulo-ulcerative lesions these are surrounded by pearly rolled borders. So that is a characteristic feature of basal cell carcinoma. Now coming to the microscopy, these resemble the normal basal layer of the skin. That is why they have got the name basal cell carcinoma. Now the nucleus are deeply basal pillic and large and elongated. And one characteristic feature is peripheral palisade. Now if we see the nucleus, they are arranged parallel to each other, just like fence. That is why the term peripheral palisade. And in the center, the cells are haphazardly arranged, just any manner. So this is the classical picture of a basal cell carcinoma. At periphery of each nest, the columnar cells arrange radially with long axis parallel to each other. The next feature is clefting artifact. Now this is an artifact which occurs. Now if this is a tumor rest, here we have a lot of connective tissue fibers. There will be a clear cut space between the tumor nest and the connective tissue, a cleft basically, a clear space that is known as clefting artifact. And why artifact? Because it occurs as an artifact in a process of tissue processing. 
that is when the tissue is put in formalin and processed because of that we get this clefting artifact so this is a microscopic picture we see the nests of tumor cells with a clear peripheral palisading the cells are the nucleus are parallel to each other the center the cells are arranged in haphazard manner and a very clear space surrounding the nest that is known as peritumoral clefting or clefting artifact so what are the growth patterns so it can be either multifocal lesions the tumor originate in the epidermis and it can grow in different parts different areas and extend over centimeters of skin surface for a longer area they can spread out throughout or nodular lesions so nodular lesions tend to grow deeper they go deep into the dermis as cords and islands cords means they will grow in one single line islands means it will grow in this pattern so this is the different patterns so when nodular lesions they can grow as cords or islands and rarely the basal cell carcinomas metastasize so now let's just summarize basal cell carcinomas the most common location is face above the line drawn between the angle of the mouth to the pinna of the ear the risk factors light skinned individuals immunosuppression prolonged exposure to sunlight and the defect in the dna repair genetics the most important genetic factor is mutation in ptca gene and p53 genes apart from that we can also have defect in the dna repair genes morphology grossly it can be nodular ulcerative or nodulo ulcerative remember nodulo ulcerative type is the most common type of basal cell carcinoma it can be also superficial and erythematous microscopically we have the nests of cells but very characteristic feature the peripheral palisading just the nucleus are parallel to each other just like a fence the peripheral palisading and peritumoral clefting metastasis is very rare in basal cell carcinomas so that was about basal cell carcinomas